Production funding is provided by A. Reddix and Associates Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding. HIRCVA.net. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. Sadly, it's a fact of life for far too many African-Americans. Someone you know is or has been incarcerated, locked up, freedom and civil rights taken away. But what happens once that person does the time and wants his or her rights back? Now, Virginia is one of a handful of states where civil rights are not automatically restored. But you can get them back. And here to tell us about the process is the Honorable Yvonne Miller, state senator from the 5th District, and Ms. Vicki Williams-Cullens, owner of Open Door Communications. Welcome to the program, ladies. Thank, Thank you for joining me. Now, I, before we get into the nuts and bolts of what it takes to have mm -hmm. your rights restored, Senator Miller, this has been a long fight, particularly with the Legislative Black Caucus, in terms of helping people to get their rights back. And it's a fight because we view this as the new slavery. It's a way of taking away people's right to participate in the political process by voting for the people who represent them. Mm -hmm. It is a vicious process because it's almost like there is an epidemic going on where people have made almost all kinds of things felonious so they mm -hmm. can strip people of their rights to vote. Mm -hmm. It is a very bad problem and the only time that we really get kickback on this is when it happens to some prominent Virginian who mm -hmm. is very well connected, who can pull strings and make it work for them, but for poor people, for the average person who loses the right to vote because of a felony conviction, mm -hmm. it's a laborious process that over the years has been shortened, but it still is an awful process because we have many people in Virginia who were felony convicted mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years ago who are vote. so ashamed they don't tell anybody and mm. they can't trace down the records they need to apply to have their rights restored. Our process is so bad because the responsibility for tracing when it happened, the court records and all of that mm -hmm. is on the victim not on the system that controls the records, not on the system that obliterates the records after so many years. So it's just a very ugly, ugly, ugly process. process. Now, Vicki, you got involved in terms of helping yes. felons, uh, ex-felons, to restore their rights um, because of a personal issue. Yeah, my, um, some years ago, back in the 90s, my father committed a crime, did a little time, and uh, my father was a strong proponent of voting. And in the 90s, I didn't know about the process. No one knew about the process. We, we thought when your right to vote was taken, it was taken for good. Mm -hmm. And I watched him just lose a little bit as a man watching his wife going to vote, and he couldn't. So when I started to work at the State Board of Elections back in 2002, I learned that there was a process, and what's called the mm -hmm. Restoration of Rights process. So I learned more about it, but I couldn't really get into it in depth because I worked for the State Board of Elections. When I left the State Board, I started to develop, I had a passion for it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know what? I think I'm going to develop a train to train a workshop through my business, and I'm going to start training people how to help people get their rights restored. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get in, into that, and, and we'll, we'll talk very specifically sure. about what needs to happen, but Senator Miller, first of all, when we say restoration of rights, what are we talking about specifically? We're talking about restoration of your right to vote, mm -hmm. your right to serve on juries, and it qualifies you so that you can go through another process and have the right to bear a firearm. Okay. Okay, but you can't automatically, for the most part, if you get through the first part, you still have to go through another process in order to bear a firearm. Yes. Be able to carry. Why do people... From, from an African-American perspective particularly, and I'm asking this of mm -hmm. both of you, sure. why is this so critical for our community, for these rights, once someone has done their time to be able to get back to it? Because so many of our people are certified as criminals. 
and they are certified as criminals for offenses that other people have dismissed in the courts. Mm -hmm. have families that are able to provide legal counsel and the legal counsel is able to s make sure they are not certified as a felon. And so because many of our people are without resources, they are allocated to court appointed attorneys who are paid very little to work on their behalf. Some do an excellent job, mm -hmm. some do an ordinary job, and some collect their money. Mm -hmm. And so it's a bad process for poor people. Poor people bear the butt of this very ugly law in Virginia. And that's poor whether you are African American, uh, white, mm -hmm. or some other minority. Poor being if poor. You, poor is the denominator that mm -hmm. means that your rights, having your rights restored is probably going to be more difficult mm -hmm. than for someone else. So is there any movement in the legislature right now or has been in terms of beginning with Dr. The William P. Robinson mm -hmm. who was in the General Assembly who worked at Norfolk State, his mm -hmm. son William P. Robinson Jr. who was a lawyer started the process. The father started the process. The son carried the process on trying to get the law changed. Just changed so a person could have two ways of getting the rights restored. Mm -hmm. One by the governor who can do that and one by a legislative process. The legislative process has not gone through. It well, we has the governor. The governor, the right governor now still can, can it. do it. Okay. But the legislative process passed a couple of times and the voters in Virginia refused to okay that process. So you always had to start over. Hmm. And so there is we have in Virginia a core of people because they have not been affected by this process that feel it's okay to take someone's rights to vote away for life. So once you've done your time, now you have to actually go through doing the, the actual time in jail and in prison, you have to then go through probation. You have to. And then it has to be several and years after that, your, don't you? You have to pay all your fines. Okay. And then depending on whether it was a serious crime, and I have a whole list here, but of course I'm not going to read the list, mm -hmm. but there are a list of crimes where you wait two years to try to get your, before you can apply. Mm-hmm to have your rights restored. Mm -hmm. And then there are other crimes that you have to wait five years before you can apply to have your rights restored. It's a process that puts the, on the, the weight on the person least prepared to carry the weight. To to the it. state agencies control the process. Mm -hmm. if, <laughs> if I might interject, and, 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 and not to negate anything that she stated, the recent governor has shortened the process. He has shortened the process in regards to the time. He mm -hmm. has shortened the process in regards to two years. And two years, there's two applications. It's a five-year application and it's a two-year application. Mm -hmm. Two-year application is for nonviolent offenders. Five-year application is for violent offenders. And, and I want to kind of, if I can, go back to a question that you read. Mm -hmm. and, but let me just make sure our, our, our viewers understand. Yes. Two years past the time that you've paid your fines, done your time, and done your finished, probation. Right. Finished your okay. supervised probation. Okay. If you still are on probation and it's not supervised, it's from the supervised probation to time that you have finished, you gotten out two, of prison. two years after that. That's and right. then you can apply to, yes, get your, you can. to get your rights back. Yes, again. you can. And he has given, he has put a timeline on it for 60 days and they have abided by so that. So they have to give you an answer. That's right. Within 60 days. That's right. Once you've gone through everything. Once you filled out the documentation, submitted it with the correct supporting documents, they have to give you within 60 days. Mm -hmm. They're going to let you know if you're missing something or they're going to let you know whether or not you were denied. All right. But remember the supporting mm -hmm. documents I was just are controlled by, the, by other people, not by the person who committed the crime. Mm -hmm. And if those people have destroyed those records, and in some cases the records have been destroyed, they can't apply. So they, but go ahead. I'm going mm -hmm. to kick back cause with that, and, and that's a very good point. Because like she said earlier, there are definitely some folks who have records 40, 50, 30 years old. Now they've learned about this process and now they are attempting to apply. 
and some of these courts don't have it. But what they have done, and, and I've been involved in the meetings, as certainly Senator Miller has as well, mm -hmm. is that they have tried to develop a relationship, an ongoing relationship with the clerks of the courts, so that if it has disappeared, if it is not available, and, and specifically the sentencing order and proof that you have paid your fine, mm -hmm. then you need a document from the court. And the court, you present that document to the Secretary of the Commonwealth, and they will use that as that support but what documentation. What happens if, the, if that is missing? I mean, if you if your crime was 30 years ago, and they may have lost or filed somewhere your receipt that says you've paid off. But that's what, what I'm saying. The clerk of court. But but I'm saying if the clerk of court has lost it, or or not the, the specific clerk of court. No no no. But if the office, if if for some reason there is no record that you have paid your fines. At that point, does the process stop? You cannot move She's forward? She's saying that they have a process, they have a process. where they can validate you. Right. I see. Right, I see. exactly. And, oh, okay. And I apologize that I didn't explain okay. it clearer, mm -hmm. but they, when I said the document, the clerk of court will present a document saying, hey, we've tried to look for these fines, we don't have any gotcha. proof, okay. and that document will be given to the person. Now, where it becomes problematic and troubling is that a lot of people who have been convicted of, of felonies, they don't understand the administrative process. They're not comfortable with going back into a court, asking for documents. That's not their experience, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what they have done, my understanding from the Secretary of the Commonwealth, is they've started to develop an ongoing relationship with the clerks of courts to try to get them to understand, to be more welcoming, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. of someone coming in asking for that. Now, is it happening all the time? No. No. Right. Now, we, did, we were hoping that we would have had um, uh, circuit court clerk <laughs> Cynthia Morrison yes. with us who got stuck in traffic and couldn't join us but when I spoke with her she talked a lot about the governor uh, governor's office meeting with yes, the clerks of court around the, the commonwealth yes, to try to encourage them to be welcoming and so forth but but that only goes so far you're saying Senator the Bowen. other thing is that it takes person power to do that and we have cut their budgets yes ma'am and so in cutting their budget it's not that sometimes they really want to be helpful, but mm -hmm. the press of work that they have, the day-to-day, -day is so great that asking them to go back and try to validate something that happened 30 years ago or to just make an assumption to give that kind of documentation is asking a lot. We mm -hmm. just need to get rid of this process. I understand also that one of the... the uh, hang-ups, if you will, in trying to gather all your documentation was that you needed a letter of recommendation or, or mm -hmm. letters of support from people. And now there's a form that can be filled out as opposed to someone having to actually write a letter. Is that correct? Let me stop you on that one. That is for the five-year application for a violent offender. Okay. Um, it is a huge packet. It started off like 20-something odd pages. It's gone down to 15. It is still huge. Um, mm -hmm. It is still laborious. It is still convoluted. But for the nonviolent offender, which a lot of people fall into those categories, it is not something that is needed. It is not something that they have to provide. And Governor Warner, he shortened that application to one page. Mm -hmm. uh, what they do ask, though, for even the nonviolent uh, offenders in the two year application, if you will, is you still provide the sentencing order and still provide proof of your fines because that would expedite the process. But unfortunately, the five year application still asks for the very same documents that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I see you shaking your head. It's such a process that is, it, it, it also humiliates people. Mm -hmm. There are people who committed a felon early in their lives, they are now respected members of the community. They haven't even told their wives or their children about mm -hmm. this. And to try to get those rights restored is a process that will bring them great hurt and great embarrassment. The Commonwealth of Virginia needs to come kicking and screaming into the 21st century and get rid of this antique process. And mm -hmm. it, they'll never do it until the people and the public 
force them to do it because the legislators are not going to do it until there is a hue Human and cry. cry from the people in their districts. Mm -hmm. And there are people who sit on the certain committees, I think it's Privileges and Elections yes, in the House of Delegates, yes, who mm -hmm. kill the bill at 7.30 in the morning. I introduce this bill every year. Mm -hmm. Some years they carry it over for the next year. Some years they kill it. I can get it out of the Senate. I cannot get it out of the house. house and the problem that we have is that until the people in Virginia understand that they are doing something that is against the US Constitution to de take away a person's right to participate as mm -hmm. a voting member of the society we are going to have this process with us so the best thing that anybody listening can do is to talk about this in your church talk about it in your community meetings talk about it in your sorority and fraternity meetings talk about it wherever you are so people will understand that we are doing an injustice to fellow Virginians who paid their right to society and we are still punishing them. All the way along. Well, speaking of the community coming together, <laughs> in Portsmouth coming up is the um, Zeta Phi Beta sorority, mm -hmm. um, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority and Delta Sigma Theta sorority are getting together to do a workshop in June. That's right, June and 11th. And you are moderating it, I believe. I am. I am the facilitator. But this is, this is to actually have people come in to sit down and learn what they need to do, what papers they need to gather, what Absolutely. the process is. Is that what this is about? Absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's kind of a, a mixture. One, I want to make sure that they're informed. I, I want to make sure they understand the process. And if they're ready to do it, We'll have notaries there to help them. We'll have people there to help them go through the process. As she has stated before, you know, a, a lot of people who have gone through this, they're ashamed, they're not comfortable, they don't know, they're not sure, and some of them may have literacy problems. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that we create an environment of comfortability and trust so that they can be open with the information and that we're there to assist them to complete the documentation. And additionally, uh, because it is something that is a passion of mine, I want to make sure that they understand that they're not bad people, they're just people who have done bad things. Mm -hmm. And you cannot continue to allow that be over your head. I piggyback on, on what Senator Miller says because you are still a taxpaying citizen. You still have the right, and you should, and I make sure I say that. You have a right to go to your delegate. You have a right to go to your city council. You have a right to write to governor. Tell them what you want, and if you can't vote, let them know that your family in that district can vote them out. It is what I do there is not just mm -hmm. give you the information. When I'm done, you will walk out, and I want to make sure that you let them know. I may not have my right to vote, but don't get it twisted. You still work for me. Now, there, when President Obama, when the election was coming up in 2008, yes, didn't, was there a resurgence or was there an increase in, the, in people who really wanted to see if they could get their yes. rights restored because yes. they really yes. wanted to participate? Yes. In that. And a lot of people had their rights restored during that period. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people are committed to voting in every election. Even though that was a great stimulus to the voting, mm -hmm. we still need this process changed. We really need to make it automatic. Mm -hmm. We are putting the impetus on the least powerful person in that situation. Mm -hmm. But to, to and I, I hear what you're saying about making it automatic, 39 states have already done so. Yes. So we're way behind the curveball in terms mm -hmm. of that. But you said that Governor McDonald, at least in, in this instance, has shortened, he the, has shortened. The, the process in terms of giving you an answer. Giving right. you an answer because before what would happen is you would submit it and it would kind of go into a black hole. You wouldn't know where you were, what was happening what was going on, and then if you'd call, you wouldn't, you, you weren't receiving reciprocal communication. Mm -hmm. um, Governor McDonald has been adamant about ensuring that their staff communicates with them. And, and as I was sharing, I had asked for numbers, I, I know who to speak to, people can call. Okay. And, and so... We got about two minutes left, yes, and I want to ask this question to both of you to yes, respond to. Um, and I'll start with you, Vicki. Yes, ma'am. People who say, you know what, I don't care. They did, the child, they did the crime. I don't care if they ever get their rights back. They should have never done whatever right. it was. How do you respond to that? So that's fine that you think that. But remember that this could happen in your own family. 
Okay. Tomorrow. And remember, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We may be doing very well today. We may have a family that's pristine today, <laughs> but it can be unpristine the same evening. Absolutely. That is very, very true. Now, let's talk about the workshop is on uh, the Restoration of Rights Clinic, mm -hmm. and it is Saturday, June 11th from 9 to 1 at Portsmouth Social Services, which is at 1701 High Street in Portsmouth, and you can call 757 393 8671 for more information. It is sponsored by Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Delta Sigma Theta, and Zeta Phi Beta Sororities. Um, we got women talking about this. We got sororities talking about this. Mm -hmm. is, Fraternities are we, talking uh, about it. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so we do have some men involved in yes. this too. Yes, huh? indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Can anyone come? Do you have to live in Portsmouth to do this? Or? Anybody can come. Okay. And we're also having one on the same day in Norfolk. And if people want more information about that, they can call me at 757 816 Four four seven eight. I'll be facilitating that one too. I'm okay. A, hopefully, the Midtown Tunnel won't get me stuck. <laughs> How about that, <laughs> ladies? Thank you so much for thank joining you. me today. I really appreciate it. And when we come back, reaching back to give young folks a leg up, big brothers and big sisters on the peninsula in action. But first, here's what's happening in Hampton Roads. Children don't care what you know until they know that you care. I'm quoting the executive director of the Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Greater Virginia Peninsula. Elizabeth Chisholm understands the importance of pouring guidance and direction into the lives of children. And so do the Big Brothers and Sisters who work with the students at Newsom Park Elementary in Newport News. Our Lisa Godley caught up with the mentors and their young protégés during one of their weekly sessions. The Big Brothers Big Sisters motto is little moments, big magic. And that's just what happens here at Newsom Park Elementary School when the students and their mentors come together for an afternoon of learning, bonding, and fun. The engagement of a mentor is just a little moment. It's one hour a week, but it has huge, big dividends. You teach a child, a child um, grows, they become your friend, you become their friend, they become someone that they look forward to seeing your presence and once they know that they're there they listen to you. 25 year old Stephen Loud has only been a big brother to nine year old Zion Tillman for four months but just watching them you think they'd known each other for years. When I first got here I didn't know what to expect but just talking to him and just knowing where he's from and just seeing him in his personal life and school life I can understand I know everything about his personality I really got a good chance to fill him out and I'm his mentor I'm his big brother and I do what I can for him. Since this program is based at a public school, organizers use this time to sharpen the students' knowledge of SOLs. On this particular day, representatives from NASA Langley stopped by. So it's not that we don't like Pluto, we just gave them a little bit of different classification. So with their mentors at their side, the students tackled experiments. So look through your telescope. Can you see well through your telescope? Look through. Is something in the way? Now that he's a big brother, Stephen Loud couldn't imagine not being one. And I might not be able to change the world, but if I can start with one, one individual, one person, that's all that matters to me. So I know I'm doing something positive. So I'm glad of that. What does it look like, though? Earth. What, Earth, right? Earth. I like it because he helps me out with if I got problems and stuff. Why? Why is it blue? Blue is a very high energy wavelength. It's really high energy. It's moving very fast. And so when it hits dust particles, it can get scattered very easily. So blue is a color that scatters all over the place, and that's what we see. In addition to the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM education, that NASA provides, representatives from the Newport News Police Department are on hand to teach leadership and character development. Several of the officers are also big brothers and big sisters. He is dancing. 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 He is dancing.
Tremaine Wills met her little sister, Isis Gray, back in January. Tremaine says when she was young, she had mentors, so it was only right for her to give back. When I first met Isis, she came in and she was very excited. She kind of asked, who are you? And I was like, Tremaine. And she was like, oh, you look nice. Your hair is nice. <laughs> so it was a real receptive, very warm first meeting. And ever since then, it's been like, she's like really my little sister. This pilot program has paired 23 Newsom Park Elementary School students with 23 mentors from all over the peninsula. And things have gone so well that the goal is to duplicate this program at another peninsula elementary school. Giving others who live in the area an opportunity to make a difference in the life of a child. It's a little moment. It's a real short period of time. But the outcomes and the future impact that that has on the child is tremendously big. Please do it because, truthfully, honestly, you don't know what you're missing out on. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. <laughs> and that's our show for this evening. We'd sure love to hear from you. Become a fan on Facebook or send us a message at our website, anotherview.tv. Next week, the roundtable is back with more scintillating conversation about what's going on in black America. We'll see you next time for Another View. Production funding is provided by A. Reddix and Associates Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding. HIRCVA.net.